Hello and welcome to the 12th lecture of the Asian Development Bank 3IE Impact Evaluation Video Lecture Series. I'm going to be talking to you today about impact evaluations of environment and climate change programs. Environment and climate change programs represent new challenges for people in the development sector. This is because of two reasons. The first, they suffer from what's called the tragedy of the commons. Tragedy of the commons essentially means that there is no single individual who's really responsible and interested in bringing about the benefits from these programs. The second attribute is that they suffer from high discount rates. So people end up discounting the benefits from these programs because they usually occur much into the future versus the benefits from other programs which are much more developmental and immediate. This can be seen also in the fact that it has been estimated that we lose approximately three to five trillion dollars of natural capital every year and it's precisely because of these two reasons. If we look at the evidence in this area we find some remarkable features. In this presentation just to let you know I will be talking about payment for ecosystem services programs and protected area programs. Payment for ecosystem services programs are programs that provide incentives in the form of payments to landowners to prevent deforestation. And protected area programs are programs that set up and demarcate protected areas so that these are then not affected by automatic forest clearing activities. Now, in a recently supported 3IE systematic review, we found that the evidence in this area, and specifically in payment for ecosystem services, was very little. We found that there were only 11 studies that quantitatively showed these impacts, showed the impacts of these uh, PS systems, and only nine qualitative studies. And only two of these studies actually looked at the impact on poverty reduction. Now, impact evaluations of climate change and environment programs can answer some important questions. They can ask the first, the big order question, do these programs actually work? Do they reduce deforestation, for example? Then they can also answer second order questions. Do protected areas, for instance, always reduce deforestation? And if they don't, under what circumstances do they not reduce deforestation? Are forestry programs additional? That is, had they not occurred, would deforestation have been reduced anyway? And third but not least, how much did deforestation actually reduce by? These impact evaluations can also help to answer other questions. So if programs are reducing deforestation, does it mean lower incomes for people because they are being prevented from clearing land? If there is this trade-off, then what is the magnitude of this trade-off? What is the magnitude of the gains and what is the magnitude of losses? Where should deforestation programs be targeted to get maximum impact? And who should be targeted best so that we get the best return for our investment? As you can imagine, these are all important questions for policymakers as well. Now there is another challenge with impact evaluations of these programs and the challenge is that a lot of these programs suffer from what is called selection bias. Using the example of the programs that I'm talking to you about, which are essentially forestry programs, I'm going to explain it very briefly. Areas that get protected are those that have forests, so they have standing forests. But the fact that they have standing forests means that they have not been cleared. And they have not been cleared for agriculture. That means they have low agricultural productivity and low agricultural pro profitability. So forest programs usually bring in land with low agricultural productivity and low agricultural profitability. This is the problem of selection bias. So let's see this with the example of Northern Thailand. Now this is an elevation map of Northern Thailand. The light grey area essentially shows areas which are low elevation and the dark grey areas show areas that have high elevation and therefore are remote. 
Now, what is interesting is, but not coincidental, that most protected areas are really located in these high elevation areas. So the white cutout area that you're seeing in this map is essentially showing protected areas, and you find that these are mostly located in areas with high elevation. So what is the big problem here? Areas with high elevation and slopes and other factors that also affect agricultural productivity such as bad soils are where protected areas are mostly located. But given this, can we really conclude that protected areas and forestry programs help in preventing deforestation? Now let's look at the example of the Payment for Ecosystem Services program in Mexico. I'm using the example of a 3 ie supported study which was recently concluded and was undertaken by Jennifer Alex Garcia and her co-authors. This payment for ecosystem services essentially makes payments for hydrological services and it provides five-year contracts which payments for which vary between $27 per hectare to $36 per hectare depending on the vegetation type that you're helping to prevent the clearing off. The people that are enrolled in this program essentially have to make an application and from this they are then segregated into those that are eligible and those that are not eligible. And from the eligible ones is chosen also the comparison group. The method that the researchers ended up using in this study is what is called differences in differences, using comparison groups to establish common starting values and trend values. Now, the choice of comparison group is especially interesting here. The comparison group was chosen from the group of applicants into this program that had mainly three kinds of characteristics. First, those applicants that had all of the qualifications but the program ran out of funding. Second, those that were located outside of the eligible zones or had less forest cover. And third, those that just lacked adequate paperwork but would have made, into, made themselves into the program anyway. So what did the evaluation find? The evaluation found that the program reduced loss of NDVI or normalized difference vegetation index by 62%. This translates into reduced deforestation of approximately 2 hectares for every 100 hectares of plots in the program. The second thing it found that there were larger impacts seen in communally held lands and also on lands with lower slopes and those that are closer to cities and in less poor municipalities. Importantly, the evaluation found that there were no significant wealth gains for anyone. The second example that I'm giving here is that of the protected area system in Thailand, which was a study that I did with two of my co-authors. In this study, we are looking at whether protected area system in Thailand, which is fairly extensive, actually helps to reduce deforestation in these areas. We used a very interesting and very detailed spatially disaggregated GIS or Geographic Information System database. So we used a protected area system database that was provided by the International Union for Conservation in Nature. We used data on elevation that was provided by the Digital Chart of the World. The Land Development Department of Thailand provided data on roads as well as on land use that we then internally digitized. We also used data on soil and soil fertility that was provided by the FAO. Now the method that we used for this study is what is called instrumental variables, which is another way of saying that we used a quasi-experimental method for identification. Now what does that do? It essentially makes us hypothesize relationships. So first we hypothesize that the probability that land will get cleared is determined by the soil of that land. So the more fertile the soil, the more likely that it will get cleared. Its slope, the steeper the slopes, the less likely that it, it will get cleared. The elevation, the higher elevation of the land and therefore more remote the land, the less likely that it will get cleared. Distance to the market, 
that is the further away the market the less profitable it is to clear land and therefore it won't be cleared administrative factors and population pressure so if there is other things held equal a lot of pressure on this land because of a lot high density of population then it is likely that land will get cleared the second thing we did was to hypothesize as to what affects the probability that land will get protected and we hypothesized that almost the same factors will also determine as to whether this land will get protected or not but we said that there is an additional factor that helps us to understand as to whether land will get protected or not and this is its proximity to a watershed area now the idea is that if land is located close to a watershed area an area which usually has high levels of biodiversity then the likelihood that it will w need to get protected all other things held equal is much higher Watersh closeness to watershed area is then called the instrument now instrument usually works as follows a watershed area or closeness to a watershed area is going to positively influence the likelihood that that plot of land gets protected because of its high level of biodiversity but the fact that it is getting protected is going to negatively affect the probability that that plot is getting cleared because you set up management structures to prevent that clearing so this is a negative relationship but the important part of instrumental variables is that the instrument itself which in this case is closeness to watershed areas cannot directly affect the probability that that land is getting cleared so what did we find we found that after you account for selection bias there is no effect of protected areas on land clearing that is protected areas would not have been cleared even if they had not been protected we use this study to also understand as to what is the likelihood that plots of land are likely to get cleared in subsequent years in this map the yellow areas are areas that show a much higher than even likelihood of getting cleared in subsequent years in this study we found that there were 293 such plots almost 300 such plots that were threatened with imminent clearing as you can imagine such sort of predictive studies can be very important for policymakers so what are our conclusions our conclusions are overall there is very little robust evidence in the area of climate change and environment especially if you look at studies that help to determine the attributable impact of these programs on the outcomes that are related to environment and climate change second that it's very important to account for selection bias and third that experimental and quasi-experimental methods can help to deal with these biases and also to explain theories of change and the overall message is that impact evaluations can be extremely helpful in determining whether certain programs in conservation and uh, forestry should be undertaken at all and if they are undertaken to what extent they can help promote lesser deforestation and greater mitigation of climate change. Thank you.